Okay, so in the previous videos, we talked about uh, the thermodynamics of protein folding, and we said that in order to make the folding of our protein favorable or spontaneous, we want a negative delta G, okay? So negative delta G means that our reaction is exergonic or spontaneous, and that is our ultimate goal, is to get to a negative delta G, okay? Now, in order to make our negative delta G more negative, again, we said that our goal was to either make the delta H more negative, which in turn makes the delta G more negative, or we can make the delta S more positive because of this negative term, term over here, that'll help make our delta G also more negative, okay? And again, for, to make the delta H more negative, our goal is to make more, more stronger or more stable bonds in our products, which leads to more negative delta H. So again, our goal is to make kind of like the stronger bonds over here. We want to form these ones. Okay. And we also want to increase the freedom of motion of whatever is in our solution so that that would give us a positive delta S so that we can increase the entropy. Th those are the two ways that we can uh, make our delta G more negative and make our reaction more favorable. Okay, so now let's go and see what happens when we try to look at protein folding in a polar solvent and see what happens to the delta H and the delta S because our goal again is to get the negative delta G. So over here I drew part of a peptide, okay? So to orient you guys, I'm going to label uh, everything in the protein. So I'm gonna color code it and say that the backbone is this top region over here. So notice how it goes NCC, NCC, all the way to, from the N terminus to the C terminus. That's gonna be our backbone. So we're also going to have the hydrophilic R groups right over here. And I drew a serine for that. And then we're also going to have the hydrophobic R groups right over here, okay? So our, our protein is gonna be comprised of multiple hydrophobic and hydrophilic R groups. I just drew one to give you an example, but it, there's gonna be way more than that in an actual protein because you're gonna have way more amino acids, okay? So let's see how water interacts with both the, uh, pro, with the protein in both the unfolded and the folded version, okay? So in the unfolded version, when we're looking at the backbone, Notice how when we look at the water interacting with the backbone over here and over here and over here, the bonds that we're making with the backbone is an H bond, okay? So we're going to be making H bonds with the backbone. So if I can fill it in right over here. So we're going to be making H bonds. The backbone is going to be making H bonds with water, okay? Now let's look at the hydrophilic R groups. So if we're looking at the hydrophilic R groups, we're gonna be looking at the red one. Notice again how water is gonna be interacting with a serine, for example, because that's a hydrophilic R group, and it's gonna be making hydrogen bonds as well with the R group. So we're gonna say that in a polar solvent, it's gonna be making H bonds with the water. Okay, and then the hydrophobic R group in the unfolded state, well, in order to determine what type of interaction this one is, all we have to do for the green one, all we have to do anytime we're not sure what the interaction is, is we have to just look at it one component at a time. So we're gonna ignore the water molecule right now and just look at the CH3 group, okay? So looking at the CH3 group, we know that um, things that are made of carbons and hydrogens, they're gonna be nonpolar, and nonpolar residues can only form induced dipoles, okay? So the CH3 group, because it's nonpolar, can only form an induced dipole. The water molecule, now let's look at the water molecule. Because that's polar and it can form a dipole, it can form, we can form a dipole, induced dipole with this interaction, okay? So for the hydrophobic R groups, they're gonna be making dipole, induced dipole interactions with water, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna close our eyes and magically, or imagine that this protein is gonna magically fold into its native conformation, okay? So in this new folded protein, we're gonna say that the exterior is gonna be hydrophilic. And we're gonna say the interior, the core of the protein is gonna be 
hydrophobic interior. Okay, so the inside is going to be non-polar. The outside is going to be uh, hydrophilic, and we're going to explain why in a little bit a little bit later. But for the for understanding this part, you should know that the outside is going to be hydrophilic. The inside is going to be hydrophobic. And now let's think about how our protein has folded onto itself. Well, if the backbone folds in onto itself, what's going to happen is that you're going to, in order to get to this final conformation of the protein, we're going to first have our primary sequence, which is just the amino acids laid out like that. What's going to happen first is they're going to also uh, first form their secondary structures like beta pleated sheets and alpha helices. And then after that, we're going to form tertiary and then possibly quaternary if this has multiple subunits. But the idea here is we're going from primary, secondary, tertiary to tertiary so that we can have the final conformation of our protein. And as we're going between these, notice how we're forming our secondary structure. Okay, What holds together secondary structure? Well, if you remember, there's going to be hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms that hold our alpha helices and beta pleated sheets together. For example, for alpha helices, we're, we're saying that because there's ba the backbone, the, the first uh, amino acid is going to hydrogen bond with the fifth amino acid, it's N and N plus four. Okay, so the idea here is that the backbone is going to also hydrogen bond with itself in the folded state. Or let me keep the colors consistent. So let me. Okay, we're going to say that's hydrogen bonding. Okay, and it, in this case, it's going to be with itself. Okay, but to be completely clear in your answer, okay, to completely make your answer clear, you also have to know that remember there's some some of the backbone atoms that are going to be on the outside of outside edges of our protein, right? They're going to be on the outside part. So that means that we're going to say it's with itself, and some of it's going to also be with the water molecules in the surrounding environment. Okay. Now let's look at the hydrophilic R groups. The hydrophilic R groups we said it's going to be on the outside part of our protein. And what I'm going to do here is instead of it interacting with water, now what it's going to be doing is it's going to be interacting with other hydrophilic R groups. So we're going to just draw that interaction over here. And I'm just going to draw another hydrophilic R group, like another serine. And notice how, again, it's going to be making hydrogen bonds. Okay? But in this case, it's going to be making it with other R groups or with the protein itself. And again, to be completely uh, correct in our answer, Technically, there's going to be some R groups on the outside of our, pro of our protein or hydrophilic R groups there. So they're going to also interact with water as well. So for the most part, it's with itself, but it's the ones on the outside are also going to be able to interact with water. Okay. And then lastly, we're going to have water interacting with the hydrophobic R groups. Or we're going to have our protein, once it folds, not water, we're going to have the hydrophobic R groups interacting with each other in our uh, hydrophobic core. So if I just drew out some more hydrophobic R groups because they're going to be found only in our core and we're going to be excluding water. So I'm just going to be drawing an example of this. So we're going to just have another nonpolar group. So again, when you have a nonpolar group that can only form an induced dipole. So we're going to have induced dipole, induced dipole interaction. Okay. So now what we can do is we can calculate the delta H. Okay. And then the, this is only with itself because again, it's not, in the outside environment it should only be by itself because it's in the not hydrophobic core of the protein okay now what we're going to do is we're going to remember to calculate the delta h we have to do h bonds broken minus h bonds form so we're breaking these bonds in the unfolded state and we're forming these new bonds in the folded state so now let's see what happens when we break and form these bonds well in the case of the backbone we're breaking h bonds and forming h bonds so the delta h is going to be roughly zero because we're forming the same strength of bonds in the case of hydrophilic R groups, again, we're breaking and forming H bonds, so the delta H should be zero. And then for the hydrophobic R groups, we're going to say that this delta H is also roughly zero. Okay? I know you're going to say, well, we're forming slightly weaker bonds, so the delta H should be slightly positive. And yes, you'd be right. Um, but for the purpose of this class, we're going to say that it's roughly zero. And the reason being, is because if we look at the uh, delta H for the water molecules, technically water before it was making this react interaction with the CH3 groups, right? And then once the protein folds, water is instead going to be reacting with interacting with water to make H bonds. So technically, even though this delta H over here is going to be slightly 
positive because we're forming slightly weaker bonds. Water is going to be able to make slightly better bonds. So that we're going to say that the delta H overall in both the for both the hydrophobic R groups and the solvents and in the entirety of the system, we're going to say that the delta H is near zero. Okay. So you can just simplify for yourself and just say that overall, all the bonds in the unfolded and folded states is going to be around zero. But if you want to be exactly correct, the hydrophobic R groups are going to technically be making slightly worse bonds. Okay. Which is like a slightly positive delta H because we're now forming ID, ID, ID bonds. Okay. But the water molecules that we're interacting with those CH3 groups or the, in, or with the nonpolar or with the hydrophobic R groups, they're now, uh, because the hydrophobic core, the hydrophobic R groups are going to be buried in the core. The water molecules are now going to instead be interacting with other water molecules. So they're going to be making slightly better bonds, which is a negative delta H. But this is again, so minor that we're just going to effectively say that all the delta H's are going to be about zero. Okay. So if I'm going to make a count of what I just did, we're going to say that again, the delta H of the protein is going to be roughly zero. We're going to say the delta H of the solvents again is going to be roughly zero. Even though we're technically making slightly better bonds, we're just going to make it overall zero for the reason I just said before. So the delta H of the system is going to be roughly zero. Okay. So now if we're keeping tally, remember our whole goal is to make this protein fold. And if we go back to that equation that determines if the protein is going to fold, it's delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So our goal is to have a negative delta G because that makes our reaction spontaneous. Right now, we just said that our delta H is zero. So that's not going to help our protein fold. So there has to be something else that's helping our protein fold. So now let's talk about the delta S and see if that helps our protein fold. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about for the delta S is we're going to talk about the delta S of the protein. Now th let's think about this. If our protein, remember how we said earlier, our protein, it goes from something that is freely floating around. It can, it has a lot of conformations it can fall into. It's, uh, it's not yet folded. And so it has a lot of free motion before it folds. However, once the protein folds in onto itself, it decreases the total amount of con conformations that it can take. And it falls into like this native conformation that it has. So we're going to be decreasing that freedom of motion. And because we're increasing the order or decreasing the freedom of motion, we're going to be decreasing the entropy. So that's an unfavorable, that's an unfavorable change in entropy. So we're going to have a negative delta S for the protein. Okay. So we're going to say that this is negative. And again, that's because we're going from this to something that's more ordered. Now if we're looking at the solvents. Okay. So now if we're going back to keep tally of our overall delta G, again, our goal was to have a negative delta G. Right now we have a zero delta H and right now we have a negative delta S and remember a negative times a negative is a positive. So we would have a positive delta G. So right now, based on what we have, our protein would definitely not fold. And that's why what I'm about to talk about got its own name. It is so critical for the protein to fold that we, we had to name it. We had to give it its own name because without it, there's nothing else that's driving our protein fold. So the thing I'm talking about is the hydrophobic effect. So I'm going to put over here and say hydrophobic effect. And the hydrophobic effect, all it's talking about is we're talking about, let me write this. We're talking about the delta S as with regards to our solvent, which in this case is water. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a diagram of how the hydrophobic effect is working. Okay. So we have our water molecules freely floating around in our cup right over here before I added anything. Okay. Right over here. Then what, what's going to happen is I'm going to add my protein into the solution. When I add my protein into the solution before it folds, notice how our protein has again, nonpolar and polar regions. I just kind of drew in only the, the, I only drew in the nonpolar regions right over here. So you guys can see these little cages that form. So whenever you have those nonpolar regions exposed to the water, Water is going to form these things called water cages around those nonpolar groups. And kind of to show you guys what's going on. So the idea here is that water normally can make a bunch of hydrogen bonds. It, it can optimally make, it wants to make up to four hydrogen bonds. And when it's interacting with other water molecules, it can freely float around and make these clusters of water molecules so that 
you know, as it's donating and accepting protons, it can move around um, and it has a lot of freedom of motion. However, once the water molecules are interacting with the nonpolar regions, you can no longer make those hydrogen bonds. So effectively what's happening is that these water molecules are gonna be ordered into place. They're not gonna be able to make those hydrogen bonds and because they're not making those hydrogen bonds, they're gonna kind of be stuck in these ordered water cages, okay? So because we have these ordered water cages, that's not favorable for our entropy. So what's gonna happen is these, these water cages so what's going to happen is those non-polar regions are slowly going to come together. It's not that the water is pushing them. It's that this is like a, you know, a dynamic situation. Things are moving around. By chance, two of these non-polar regions might touch. And what happens is when they touch, they're going to decrease their surface area, freeing up some water molecules to float around in our solution. Free, and effectively what we're doing is when those water molecules are freed from those cages or from those regions where they're interacting with the hydrophobic groups, we're going to increase the delta S of the water for that region. Then what's going to happen is, again, another region of the protein is going to, they're going to slowly come even closer and closer together, okay? And we're going to free up even more and more water molecules, okay? And then eventually our final protein is going to get folded so that we get the hydrophobic core and the hydrophilic exterior. And because of this, the entropy of the water in our system is going to, because we're bre basically breaking all of those water cages, we're going to have the entropy of water greatly increase, okay? So that if I go back to my table right over here, yes, this had a negative delta S, and we said that the, the delta S of the solvents is going to be positive, right? Because we just said that we're going to free water from those water cages. But there's so many more water molecules than your one protein. We're going to say that even though this is a small negative delta S, overall, we're going to say that the delta S of our system is going to be positive, okay? And again, if we go back to that tally right over here, remember, our goal is to have a negative delta G, and the only way that we can have that is, well, we either need a negative delta H or a positive delta S. In this case, our delta H was zero, but our delta S was positive, so that means that our protein is going to end up folding because we get a negative delta G. So the key takeaway from this is that in, so in a polar solvent, entropy drives folding. And then we're going to say due to hydrophobic effects. And in the next video, we'll talk about in a non-polar system.